Well, welcome Foursquare Church to Team Camp. I'm, ex- I'm so excited about what we'll be sharing tonight because really I believe that these are one of the defining moments that will occur in the course of Team Camp. We're going to be discussing the priority perspective and the simple church process on page 69 and page 70 of your workbook. And I'm so excited that you're here. So why don't we do this? Why don't we all stand to our feet? Why don't we all take the hand of the person we're next to and uh, we are going to get ready to invite the Holy Spirit. I got to ask you one simple question though. How did Team feel? Team's all right? All right, all right? All right, all right. Here we go. Got our hands together. Lord Jesus, tonight I thank you and praise you for the Spirit of God that is flowing through this place. God, I thank you right now that the joy of the Lord is our strength, and you're not only going to give us emotional stability, you're going to give us intellectual access to process this thing called our walk with God. Lord, I pray that we'd become a better version of us because of what we're doing here. And God, I pray that you would bless the efforts in Jesus' name. And if you agree with that, shout amen. Amen. All right, let's give the Lord a hand. It's good to be in the house. Well, uh, tonight, what we're going to be walking through is something that is very pivotal to your development as a believer in Jesus and as a leader in Jesus. As As a matter of fact, let's say this out loud. I am a leader. Many of you uh, have difficulty believing that. But in fact, you are a leader. There's a a great deal of difficulty that occurs when someone comes into the faith with Jesus and then takes that next step to go to the next level to be a leader with Jesus for one very simple reason. People are so accustomed to following a life of the flesh But the life in the spirit is contrary to a life of the flesh. As a matter of fact, it's a paradox. It's completely inverted. And when you read the Gospels and listen to what Jesus said in the Gospels, it's kind of hard to get our arms around the way of the kingdom of God as it pertains to living a spirit-filled life and as a reality that we have to try to get uh, in our own mind is that we've given our flesh Several years of a head start. It's learned how to format and process information. It's learned how to uh, interpret uh, stimuli and how to look at scenarios and have uh, a response to said scenarios. But the things of a spirit are different than that. And so when we come into leading in the kingdom of God, we must take all of those things that we've learned from our fleshly bodies and our fleshly mechanisms submit them to the lordship of Jesus and begin to recalibrate this machine called the spirit of God that lives within us. So uh, we're going to look at uh, the priority perspective on page 69 of your workbook. Now what what is the priority perspective? Well, very simply, we refer to this as the inverted triangle. As the inverted triangle. If you were to go to a multi marketing class, which this is not, we're not selling anything. Uh, we might need uh, this camera over here to, to give me the shot. If you were going to a multi uh, marketing class, th- does that look familiar, right? You, you, you enter in at the bottom of the triangle and uh, you're at the bottom of the stages of building your business. Uh, Then you get higher up on the triangle and higher up on the triangle and higher up until eventually it's a very tippy, 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 tippy top. Well, uh, that is the way of this world, how this world thinks. And that's very common for anyone that's going to be living a life in the flesh. The challenge is when you live a life in the spirit and as you read the gospel message of Jesus Christ and the words that he says, really, he doesn't talk about Uh, the triangle, he talks about the inverted triangle. Now, what is the inverted triangle? Well, very simply, here it is. It's a priority of things, three things. That if we have these three things in alignment with our life, the rest of our life really begins to make sense. Uh, I want to give these things to you, and we're going to write these things down in the triangle in your workbook on the lower right-hand side. The first part of the priority perspective, as it pertains to Jesus Christ, and he's, as he is discipling his disciples, here's what he says. The most important thing, as it pertains to God and his son Jesus and the mission of the cross, was the church. Jesus came to build the church. Now, before we become um, inaccurate in our assessments, we're not talking about brick and mortar. We're talking about flesh and blood, primarily. 
but not exclusively because it also does include brick and mortar. This is the place where we gather and we bring our tithes and offerings, we bring our talents and gifts, we give our heart and we give ourselves a point of reference to point uh, our compass, as it were, to pull us in the right direction. Because really in this thing called life, you can either get pushed by this world or you can get pulled by the Lord. Did you hear that? I'm saying it again. You can either get pushed by the world or pulled by the Lord. And if we get our priorities in alignment, right? How many times have you ever said that to someone in your life that you care about? Hey, get your priorities straight. Well, the priority perspective as it pertains to the things of the Lord, specifically Scripture, which we're going to get to in just a moment, um, we want to have our arms around how Jesus values our priorities. Here's the second thing as it pertains to the priority perspective, and that is the team, the team. Now, now what, what does it mean, the team? You know, we, we say this phrase when we start here, how do team feel, the team's all right. Well, no one is an island under themselves. We are all part of a collective called the church. Now, the church is the, is the, is the main branch, is, is the main trunk of this tree. As this tree goes up, right, as this tree go, grows up, I'm a horrible artist. Here's my little apple tree and branches sticking off the tree. I know it looks like celery or broccoli on steroids, but give me a break. I'm not an artist. The, ch- the church is the trunk of the tree. Now, different parts of this tree will have branches that will stick off. That will be your team. As it pertains to the church here that, that we lead, for example, uh, in this church, there are many, many team members and many teams that we have within this church. And our church staff, for example. We have uh, what we call the UG team, the United Generation. Those from junior high to college. They're a member of their team. We have the children's ministry. And all the people that are involved in that ministry, they have uh, their team. We have the creative arts team, Mark and his crew. We have the teaching team, that, that the Yoli Spirit. <laughs> Pastor Yol, he has his team with the, the teaching team. We have the administrative team. We have the marketing team. And all these team members are part of this thing called the church, right? But they all have their individual teams that they're a part of. The third part of this triangle that's inverted is me. Does it look different to you? It ought to. It is a complete paradox a complete paradox of the things that Jesus communicates in the New Testament. Let's take a look, if we could, at Matthew chapter 20, verse 16. Matthew chapter 20, verse 16. So those who are last now will be first then. It, doesn't that sound curious? And those who are first will be last. Jesus points out very clearly this paradox of the kingdom of God, that if you want to be first in the kingdom of God, you got to run to the back of the line so you can be first. If you, if you want to be free, you have to surrender and give in and become a slave. If you want to have more than you could ever imagine, you have to give it away. And those are paradoxical to the things of the flesh, right? The flesh says you run to the front of the line so you can be first. You fight so you can be free, and you hoard so you can have more than enough. It's a paradox of the kingdom of God. So it is absolutely imperative that we get our arms around this priority perspective. Now, why is the triangle so important to the church? That's the first blank we're going to fill in. Why is the triangle so important to the church? Well, there are, there are I believe this, in this thing called life, there are four. Everyone say four. There are four fronts of this thing called life where we must fight successfully. If you fight these four fronts successfully, you're going to have a successful, significant life. I promise you. There are four fronts that you must fight. They they are the personal front, the the corporate front, the adversarial front, and the supernatural front. And we're going to give you those again. But the personal, the corporate, the adversarial, and the supernatural. We, We have to get successful at identifying and, uh, and properly fighting those fronts. If we fight those four fronts successfully, we are going to have a life that's filled with godly success. Anybody want that? 
Mm-hmm. Me too. Here's the first fight. We need to fight internal depravity. We need to fight internal depravity that is, in fact, the personal front. We need to fight internal depravity that is the personal front. We need to fight internal depravity. It's the personal front. Let's look, if we can, at Romans chapter 1, verse 28. Romans 1, verse 28. Here is the heart of God as he speaks to us about the tussle of of fighting with people that don't want to surrender and fight the fight of of internal depravity. Now, what is depravity? We're going to get to that in a minute. But let's look at this verse. Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, people that didn't want to fight that fight, I don't want the knowledge of God, I don't want to fight that fight, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not be done. Okay, so what is internal depravity? Every single person on the earth is born into a state of depravity, being depraved, meaning we are all, every one of us, without exception, birthed into sin. Every single person is birthed into sin, and we all have to fight this thing called depravity, and the only weapon that defeats a sinful nature is the blood of Jesus. So here, here's, here's what, what I mean by that. Uh, when we were in uh, eighth grade, right, we learned that there's a thing called the sun in the middle of our solar, solar system. Then we have Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, <laughs> Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto. And all of these planets have what? They have an orbit, right? They have an orbit around our sun. The sun is a star. The sun does not move. I can't draw very well, but you get the picture. There are orbiting planets around this sun, and the sun is stationary, giving light and warmth. Well, until we get the inverted triangle securely ensconced within our philosophical approach to life, what begins to happen is we get an inverted solar system, if, it, if, if you will. The sun, S-O-N, ceases to be the center. We put ourselves at the center of our solar system, and we invite God to start orbiting around us. And that depravity is what makes, get this, chaos and drama. Anybody experiencing chaos and drama in your life recently? Yeah, uh, me too. All drama and all chaos stems from the absence of the inverted triangle and the sequestering, conquering spirit that defeats depravity. Depravity arises when we become the center of our solar system and we push Jesus and the Holy Spirit off and invite him to orbit around us. God never set it up to work that way and he won't work that way. And we see in Romans, he says, hey, fine. If you want to push off everything that I have to offer you by way of fruitfulness and success and a life of fulfillment and, 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 uh, and an outrageous significance, fine. I'll let you be the center of your solar system to see how well you can do. That's the first fight, internal depravity. Uh, Here's the second thing, the fight that we need to fight. If we will fight this fight uh, righteously, there will be a a net result. It will ignite something. It will ignite, ignite family unity, which is our corporate front. It's our corporate front. There's a there's an igniting, an igniting of family unity. Uh, uh, Anybody have a, a barbecue? Barbecue at your house? Okay. Uh, here in the Northwest, we have a barbecue. At Silver Creek, I, I know Phil and Jenna, they have a barbecue there. Uh, Doily, I know, Doily has like this gourmet barbecue. It's like almost illegal. I think he must have, you know, bought it from like a restaurant going out of business. Doily, you're crazy. I love you, bro. Um, here in Puyallup, uh, I have a barbecue and bought it four years ago, and um, it's starting to wear. Have you noticed that about your barbecues? They just start to wear out. The grill starts to disintegrate into the, you know, the cavernous holding tank called the grill. Well, what else breaks on a barbecue? The igniter button, right? That thing goes out all the time. They, those things, they might as well not even put them on there. But uh, in our barbecue, the igniter button went out. So here's what I learned. If you turn the gas on and close the lid and just let it percolate for like, you know, a minute or two, you start building what's known as 
a bomb <laughs> or a barbecue. And what I do is I take this butane lighter and I put it in, underneath there and I uh, get my uh, asthmat suit and <laughs> go down my deck and I pull the trigger of that butane lighter and poof, all this flame comes pouring out of my barbecue lid. Uh, keep small pets and children away. They will get hurt. Do you know that there's a, a lot of family discord that goes on in families? Why? Because families are running in so many different directions. Families are, 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 are going to, they're living for club soccer. They're, they're living for their, their skiing trips. They're living for their scrapbooking clubs. They're living vicariously through their children's dance recitals. They're running a hundred miles an hour, right? Anybody identify with that? I know how crazy it is to be part of this thing called a family. And, and even, you know, if you don't have a, a nuclear family living in your house, we're all, if, if we're married or single, we have demands on our time that just keep us going. And so many families are going so many different directions that there are no anchors keeping people stabilized. Well, Jesus gave us the church as a stabilizing force. You know what? The priority perspective in many people's life is soccer and hunting and scrapbooking and dance and fill in the blank. God never intended for those things to be the anchors of our life, to give us meaning and fulfillment. God gave us the church. And when we have the priority perspectives in place, when the church comes first, right, and the team comes second and we come third in that priority structure, there begins to be incredible unity. That's what I love about our church. Puyallup, listen to me. I love you. Puyallup Four Square Church, I love you. Why? We have very marginal drama. We have little, we have just very little drama. Why? We have incredible unity. Why? Because we understand that Jesus is the head of this church. Not Roger, Jesus. And we're all alongside one another. No one is beneath, no one is above. We are all in this together. Isn't that great? Do you know what that does? It ignites unity. If you fight the battling fight of unity, you will have fruit. Look at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 3. Ephesians 4 and verse 3. Here's what Paul says. He says, I want you to make every effort to keep yourself united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace, with the unity of peace. He says, make every effort to be united. Man, aren't there so many reasons why we can be in discord? Of course there are. We have justifiable reasons to have chaos and drama. But you know what? When the church is at the center of your solar system, what happens is all those things just orbit and they go into darkness and they disappear. Oh, they'll come back when sunlight hits it. But you know what? They're not major drama points in your life because that's the fight we need to fight. Number three, when we have the priority perspective in place, it truly spoils demonic strategy. That's our adversarial fight. It spoils demonic strategy. That's our adversarial fight. We have learned uh, through this last couple uh, of, of teaching series that we've been going through, this phrase that I love to state, that people are not the enemy. The enemy is the enemy, right? People are not the enemy. The enemy is the enemy. As we look at Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, I would like us here in Puyallup, Silver Creek uh, at Summit and down in Downey, California, we're all going to read this out loud together. Wherever you are, whatever living room or house or church building you're in, we're going to read it out loud together. You ready? Here we go. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and the authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirit. In heavenly places. You see, we have to fight the fight where the fight originates. People are not the enemy. The enemy is the enemy. And when you have the priority perspective in place, when that inverted triangle is in place, when you are at the bottom and the church is at the top and you are investing your heart, soul, and lifeblood into making sure your priorities are straight, what happens is everything else becomes effortless. The fight is not so dramatic. It's not so dramatic. I remember when my, my young daughter, was um, Adrian, was, was hanging out with some kids and, uh, you know, that little father-o-meter was going off inside of me. And I said, you know what? Those kids you're hanging around with, you're not going to hang around with them anymore. 
you would have thought I told her she had terminal cancer. <laughs> Daddy, no, no. And that was just last year when she was 18. No, I'm kidding. She was, she was in fifth grade. Uh, she's in fifth grade. And, and here, was her fra- here, here was her statement. Her statement was, my friends are my life. I said, oh, really? Really? Your friends are your life? What was lost to her? The priority perspective of the gospel, right? It didn't stay lost for very long because I helped her (laughs) get there. Uh, Aren't I a good dad? Well, there are demonic strategies that become spoiled when we have the inverted triangle in place. Uh, Like all good husbands do, I went to the grocery store for my wife because I know I'm not sure what it is, but most husbands they kind of like going to the grocery store. I think they like being around the smell of food, and we just kind of like going there. Uh, most wives do not like going to the grocery store. It's like a drudgery. I love it. I could spend like all day there, and and take the free samples from Costco. <laughs> but anyway, I, I went to the store and I I we love buying uh, fruit at our, our family. We have lots of fruit in our house all the time. And in my car, uh, the bag had spilled over and some apricots went underneath the seat. And they didn't get discovered until seven days later. And there was this stench in my car. And it was nasty. And I couldn't figure out what it is. I took it to a detailer. I said, I, I can't find it. I mean, I can't find the smell. This thing is horrible. And the guy that, that took the seat apart found the apricot that rolled underneath the seat. He goes, well, you have maggots growing in your car. It's nasty. Yeah, the apricot had become a colony of maggots. You know what? As, as, as tantalizing as ripe fruit is, that's how the devil comes out of hell with a strategy against us. But when we live in the principle of the inverted triangle, it spoils. It spoils. It spoils his strategies. Don't you want to spoil the devil? I know I do. Number four, the fourth front. When we live in the priority perspective, it supports the divine camaraderie. That's the supernatural front. It's the supernatural front. It's so crazy, you know, when you think about how powerful God is. The the word that describes God is omnipotent, meaning all-powerful. He's omnipotent, not limited in power. And yet he restricts his omnipotence against the facade or the facing or the wall of humans' free will. Our human free will, he stops, he holds himself at bay against our free will. When we live in priority perspectives, when we live in the inverted triangle, what happens is we willfully lower the wall around our free will and say, Holy Spirit, come be supernatural in my life. Isn't that awesome? The supernatural power of God comes into our life and it begins to support us. And then we actually lend support to the divine powers of God and we have camaraderie. We have camaraderie. Does that mean that God has gotten on our side? Not at all. Let's take a look at Joshua chapter 5, verse 14, verses 13 through 14. The children of Israel have crossed into the promised land and Moses has died and Joshua is leading the troop and he's intimidated, kind of, kind of scared, a little, bit, uh, a little bit of trepidation going on in his heart with all the walled cities and the giants and the, the Nephilim that are living in the land, the giants of like Goliath, uh, uh, David and Goliath. Well, Joshua, in, in his walk around the wilderness, encounters this great big hurricane angel, nine feet 600 pounds, you know, 40 inch chest, 80 inch, uh, uh, 80 inch chest, 40 inch waist with a great big flaming sword drawn. And, and I love what he says. Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a sword drawn in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, are you for us or for our enemies? And the answer was like really intriguing to me. He says, Neither. <laughs> Sorry, this was a multiple choice test with two questions. Us or them? Neither. He replied, but as a commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. You know what God is saying? Joshua, I'm not on your side, and I'm not on the side of the Canaanites. I'm on God's side. Now, Joshua, what side do you want to be on? You see, that's how God responds to us. He, he is not for or against us. He's for his will and his way. What is his will and his way? The inverted triangle, the church priority perspective. 
And when we say yes to God, it creates a wonderful sense of harmony between creator and creation. Okay, so let's go on to the next line. How does the triangle stabilize the church? We want to talk about how the triangle stabilizes the church. Well, number one, it provides a healthy tension between symbiosis and systemology. Now, what what exactly are you talking about here, Raj? Well, uh, before I go on, here's what I want you to do. Take your pen or your marker, and I want you to underline or circle or highlight that word tension. That word tension. Before we get into the description of symbiosis and systemology and comparing the two, uh, whenever you say the word tension to someone, there's not generally a very good connotation, is there? Like, Like tension... Uh, every married person knows tension, right? Every parent knows tension. Every dating person that has a fight with their person they're dating, they know tension. Every employee knows tension. Every business owner knows tension. Any person with a former 401k that's become a 201k knows tension, right? Everyone knows tension. So tension sometimes gets a bad rap, but really there are, there are forms of tension that are absolutely uh, necessary. For example... If you're shooting a bow and arrow, right? Shooting a bow and arrow. On this string of this bow, there's tension based by the bow. Now, if you were to to take the tension off of this bow and off this string, you know what? You're not going to be able to launch the arrow. This arrow will not remotely be able to be launched. Why? Because there's not healthy tension between the string and the bow. However, when you put the tension on the bow with the string and you put this arrow on the string and you pull the thing back, no, I'm not going to do it because uh, I would hurt something or someone. The, The tension that exists there is a good thing. When you have the priority perspective in place in your life, what you will find is a very healthy sense of tension that will exist between symbiosis and systemology. Now, now what exa- exactly is that? Now, we all know that symbiosis is when two organisms exist together for mutual benefit. That's symbiosis, right? It, it, it's an organic reality. It, it, it's, it's not systemology. An assembly line is, is, is systemology. When, when uh, in Detroit, when they make those wonderful Precious Ford Mustang Cobras. Oh, Jesus, love you. When they make those wonderful cars in Detroit, they start with a hunk of metal and it goes down the assembly line. That's a system. And so many people have approached God in a systematic way, right? They, they approach God with rules and orders, turning square corners, crossing T's, dotting I's, being very legalistic in how they come to God. Well, you know what? It's important to have systemology. You need a systematic way of working through your theology, but the relationship isn't based on systemology. What's it based on? Symbiosis, right? An organic life form that that mutually exists with mutual beneficial uh, realities with one another. And, And in your inverted triangle, there must be a healthy tension. Everyone say tension. There must be a healthy tension between symbiosis and systemology. And if you don't have a priority perspective of the inverted triangle, you won't have that. Okay, so let's look at this next bullet. On a scale of 1 to 10, on a scale of 1 to 10, would you say, would you say, let's do this uh, like this. Everyone make this scale on your, on your uh, chart. Uh, 10 being high, 0 being low, 5 being the mean. On 10, would you say you are touchy-feely? I'm not even sure if that's accurate or not. Okay, uh, I, I, think that, I think it is. Would you say you're touchy-feely, or would you say you're more systems-oriented? Touchy-feely or more systems, right? Fried green tomatoes, steel magnolias, <sighs> Or Tron. <laughs> you know, are you, are you touchy-feely or are you more systems-oriented? Now, if you lean toward the system side, you're going you're gonna to like approaching God with 
definitive, I can do this and I can't do that. These are the things I may do, the things I may not do. This is the, the posture that I sit in into my seat and when I worship my God, I hold my hands like this. You like being told how to do it. You like to know what the manual says, the specifics of the engagement. But if you're a, a touchy, feely type person, that stuff just gives you a headache. It, it, it makes your head hurt. You just want to feel God, right? You want to feel his holy presence. But you also need systems in order to balance that when your feelings go away or become fickle or betray us, right? So we need a good, healthy tension, right? A good, healthy tension between uh, symbiosis and systemology. Number two, uh, it provides a healthy union. Would you uh, circle the word healthy and then circle the word union? Underline them or highlight them. When you have the priority perspective, when the inverted triangle is working in your life, you have a healthy union between organizational and the organic, the, the chain of command or the org chart. Now, on my, the, the left finger, the fourth finger of my left hand, I have uh, this ring. With this ring, I thee wed. And with all of my worldly goods, I thee endow. I had $11 on our wedding day. And Tina goes, oh, yippee for me. Aren't I the, the lucky girl? I'm the lucky girl that gets to have Roger's $11. Wonderful. Well, this ring, when you walk around Starbucks or you go into the grocery store or you go to the movie, you'll see, you know, I'm not sure what it is, but everyone kind of looks, says, are you married or are you single, right? Just because this ring is on someone's finger, it doesn't mean that their union is healthy. It means they have a union, but it doesn't mean it's healthy, right? How do you measure a healthy marriage? There are a lot of ways, and this is not a marital seminar because we can go down that road. We're talking about how you engage a healthy union with God. And with God, it begins with identifying the priority perspectives of the inverted triangle, right? Now, in this next bullet point, it says, this fight must be fought at the senior leader level. Dear one, you are a leader created by God to lead. You are created by God to lead. And when, when you lead, there are other people that are naturally going to be following you. You have to set the pace and set the course. You have to establish by example, right? You have to establish by example. Um, let me make this statement. I, as a matter of fact, if you open up your, some of you have your books folded over, I can tell. But open up your book right now, and uh, 68 is showing, and 69 is where we're at. Would you write this in the margin down there on page 68? The water level of leadership will not surpass that of the leader. I'll say it again. The water level, right? The water level of leadership in any environment, the water level of leadership will not surpass that of the leader. The water level of leadership will not surpass that of the leader. Why is that so important? Because uh, I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, I heard this said all the time, do as I say, not as I do, right? Well, you know what? P people will do that. People in business, they'll do that. Uh, people in, in a home, they'll do that. People in a church, they'll do that. But they'll do it with contempt. They'll say, you hypocrite. You have all the power. You have all the authority. You have all the muscle. And so you have to make me do this, but you don't model it yourself. You are, in fact, by definition, a yeah, hypocrite, right? When we hear those words, do as I say, not as I do, it keeps the water level down at the septic level. But you see, when we start living an ex a, a life of, of, of a servant, when we live the example of being a servant, what occurs is the water level begins to rise for everyone. 
As a parent, I want to model for my kids doing dishes. I want to model for my kids doing, uh, taking out the trash. I want to model for my kids picking up my own clothes. I want to model for my kids pushing the vacuum. That's not beneath me, pushing the vacuum. No way. I'm a servant. And that, and that inverted triangle, Jesus said in Matthew 20, 16, uh, it, it, those who are first now will be last then. You know what? In my own mind, I don't want to be first. I don't want to be the big machismo. I don't want to be the lowland gorilla. Rah, 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 rah. I don't want to be that guy. I want to be the servant that has the solar system in sight, right in my sights. And my life is orbiting around the sun, right? And when that happens, the water level gets, uh, gets raised. Now, it, it provides this inverted triangle, number three. It provides... Team measurements and models. It, it provides team measurements and models. Uh, it's kind of interesting, the bullet points I, I, I have written down here. You know, as a senior pastor in many churches, there's a spot reserved, right, reserved for senior pa- pastor parking. Senior pastor. We'll call that the SPP, <laughs> senior pastor parking. Do you know where I park my car? A quarter of a mile away. Every Sunday and Saturday, because I want to leave the best spots for the people that are coming to church for the first time. Uh, is, is your office the holy of holies, right? Uh, there are many churches where no one may enter, you know, they have to have the secret handshake and the, and the secret key that goes in and you have to retinal scan and put the fingerprints and to get into the senior pastor's office. That's just a room in this building. It's not a holy of holies situation. This, this church isn't mine, that office isn't mine. Because what do I know? Nothing I have belongs to me. It all belongs to God, and I'm just watching his stuff. Right? When the priority perspectives are in place, you have a true sense of uh, the absence of territorialism, the absence of entitlement, the absence of elitism. I don't know about you, but that just stinks in my nostrils. When, when, that, when that sense of elitism and, and I'm better than you because, whether it's in church or business or sports or whatever, that just stinks. Right? It's measured by idea deferral. Idea deferral. I don't care who has the best idea here as long as the best idea is picked. Uh, raises, perks, compensation, interdepartment support, ministry. All of these things are identifiers. They're measurements and tools. Because if you have to think about it, it's too late. It has to be a reflex rather than a response. Your life of being a servant has to be a reflex rather than a response. You know, our, our muscles are divided into two groups in our body, involuntary and voluntary. Aren't you glad you don't have to think about your heart beating? <laughs> I'm never going to sleep. Never. Your heart is an involuntary muscle. It just beats because, right? If someone were to shoot that bow at me, I'd be ducking for cover with my voluntary muscles. The inverted triangle causes us to be the greatest in the kingdom of God. Now, let's turn over and let's look at the simple church process. The simple church process. Uh, we, 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 filter, we filter people here at, at this church, at Silver Creek Summit and in Downey and, and Palm Desert and, and here in Puyallup. Um, we filter people in, in one of four places. Uh, we believe that uh, all 6.6 billion people on the earth are in one of four places. It's very four square. Uh, you're either a seeker, believer, disciple, or a teacher. That, that's where you fit. In this thing called the church, and by the way, just because someone is an atheist or an agnostic doesn't mean that they're on another planet. It just means that they're in a different circle, <laughs> right? They're in the first one. They're in a seeker. They're in a seeker place. Just because someone is in an, in an, in an occult, that means they're a seeker. That's all that that means based on our simple church process. Uh, I, I would like you to look at Matthew chapter 9 and verse 37 and 38. Then he, meaning Jesus, said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Do you hear the lament in Jesus' voice there? Man, all of this golden wheat, all of this golden, golden wheat the fields are so ripe. And we have a sickle with a maimed person out 
knocking it down. You almost hear the lament of Jesus that this harvest, this earth is so ready for the harvest, but the laborers are few. I like verse 38, though, because this gives us hope. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. What do you think is on the mind of Jesus? Let me just tell you. The harvest. The harvest is on the mind of Jesus. Now, as a leader, um, moving people from where they are to where Jesus wants them to be must be the critical uh, driving force that wakes us up in the morning. As a leader, as a Christian leader, we must not be thinking about, well, all I want to do is just teach them Hellenistic Greek. I want to teach them how to conjugate a, a, a verb. I want to show them how to use a concordance. You know, that, that's good for discipleship. And we need discipleship. We need that in, in, in the church today. But really, the thing that's got to wake us up out of the bed in the morning is the harvest. The, that's why Jesus came. Jesus said, I have come to seek and to save that which was lost. In Matthew 9, 37, 38, he's talking about the harvest. And so as leaders, what we must do is we must be thinking about the harvest, but we also can't just be thinking about just getting people to know God. We got to move them around the bases, if you will. We have to get them from where they are to where God wants them to be. Now here in Seattle, uh, some of you will appreciate this, uh, some of you baseball fans. We have probably the finest leadoff hitter probably in the history of Major League Baseball. Uh, Japanese-born uh, Ichiro Suzuki. He, he is so good, he has his first name on his jersey. <laughs> Ichiro. That's what people know him by. Can you imagine? Uh, Chuck. Even Barry Bonds didn't have, hey, Barry. <laughs> you know, the, only one person has had his first name on his jersey, Ichiro. And, and Ichiro gets on base. His on-base percentage is off the chart. But as a Seattle Mariner fan, you know what's frustrating? When Ichiro gets on first at the, top of the, fir- at the bottom of the first inning, we're at home here in Seattle, and, and Ichiro gets on base, and we can't move him around to score, and he gets stranded on a base. Man, it's so frustrating. You know, you think, move the guy around. Bunt. Get in the way of the pitch. Get hit. Whatever. Move him around the bases. But so often, Ichiro gets stranded. Why? Because we don't execute baseball to get him to score. Well, uh, here on page 70, uh, I want to talk to you about why we need to have a process. I'm not going to submit to you that seeker, believer, disciple, teacher is, is the only process on the earth. I'm just telling you it's our process, and it works for us doesn't make it the best and it doesn't make it the only. It just makes it one that works. What's important to you is the, phil- th- the philosophical reality inside of your head that you have to move people around the bases. You have to get them going. You can't let people be just stuck where they are without moving them around to get them to score. So you need to have a process. Now, I invite you to adopt seeker, believer, disciple, teacher. It's one that works. It's not broken. If it ain't broke, Don't fix it. (laughs) Just make it better, right? Now, we're going to talk about the harvest. We're going to talk about the harvest. And this is very sequential. When, when When you wake up in the morning, tomorrow morning, wherever you wake up, I challenge you to look at the world as a harvest wheat field. In the middle, the corn is as high as an elephant's eye. And it's looked like it's climbing clear up to the sky. Oh, what a... I'm stopping, that's all. That's all I got. Um, Beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful... uh, Oklahoma, you gotta love it. We need to start seeing the world as a harvest field. Harvest. And people are the harvest. And And the field is just bowing. Microsoft, the hospital, Red Robin, (laughs) the mall, Albertsons. That's the field, right? Your neighborhood. Maybe for some of you, your own house. That's the field. And the harvest are the people walking about in that field. Okay, so if we're going to talk about the harvest, here's what we need to do. Number one, uh, we need to have an identification of the harvest. That's what I'm talking about. Having an identification of the harvest. 
I was uh, at the Rock Pizza today, and we were sitting in the bar. And the reason why we were sitting in the bar with uh, our worship pastor, our children's pastor, and our technical pastor is because there is a, there's a bartender there that I have been witnessing to for over a year. And I've been sharing my faith with this, this gal, and she's a mom, single mom, two kids. She's going to nursing school, and, f- and for a year, for a year, I've just been uh, just talking to her, and I've, I've just been um, inviting her to church, and, and, and just she asked what I do, and I tell her I'm a pastor, and she goes, and you're sitting in the bar? I said, hey, I think Jesus might be here talking to you. You know, that's just kind of what Jesus, how Jesus would roll. And, and so uh, we were having our lunch today, and I said, uh, I said, so how you doing? She goes, well, I'm a little bit stressed out because, you know, I'm trying to balance nursing school, and um, I'm, a, I'm trying to do this job and take care of my two kids. And so uh, the, the cool thing is I identified the rock pizza as the field, I identified her as the harvest. Now, the second thing I need, I need, I need a strategy or a proposition to reach the harvest. I need a strategy. So here's this gal, and, and she's a hardworking single mom. I've identified her as the harvest, right? And my strategy is this. Hey, can I pray for you? I mean, I know it's kind of a weird out there deal, but I believe God's in heaven. He has supernatural power. And it looks like you could stand a, a dose of God and his help to help you in this situation you're in. Man, her eyes just kind of welled up, and I said, yeah, come, come sit down. So she sat down beside us, and, and we prayed for her. You know what? She said, when, when are your church service times again? I, I just got to come to church. I got to get to church. You see how that works? It's not, it's not being a, a weirdo with an A-board around your sign with a megaphone, and if God tells you to do that, then be a weirdo for Jesus. Praise God, I'm not going to, you know, just tell him you go to Bethany Baptist, and it'll be great. But, <laughs> but what I want you to do is I want you to begin to identify the harvest and then have a strategy to reach the harvest. And then once we have our strategy to reach the harvest, we need to have expectations of those one from the harvest. Because all, all too often, people come in from the harvest field and they give their heart to God and then nobody expects anything of them. Do you know what? That is contrary to the human spirit. The human spirit knows, okay, now what do I do? Right? If I went down, if I were 25 years old and I, and I made the, if I tried out, and I, had, I was a free agent and tried out for the Seattle Seahawks and I made the team, Right? I wouldn't just stand on the sidelines. I would have to do something. People know, people know. If you, if, if you spend a half a cup of coffee in church, you know that God wants something. God wants us to do something for him. He wants it. And that's something that we do. Check this out. It feeds the beast within. It feeds the spirit within. Because that's called finding your purpose in life. We are here to satisfy the inverted triangle and the priority perspective. We are here, Silver Creek. We are here, Summit. We are here, Puyallup. We're here, Downey. We're here, Palm Desert. We're here to reach the harvest. That's why we're here. And so when we, uh, when we have this um, expectation, and so you know, when, when people come to the church, they say, okay, what do you expect out of me? How do I become a member here? Really, that, that's the question people ask. How do I become a member here? What's, what's my, you know, what, what are the hoops I have to jump through? You know what I tell people? Two things. I expect two things. Because this is not a cruise ship. It is a battleship, right? I expect you to discover your gifts and use them for God in this church. I expect that of you. To discover your gifts and use them for God in this church. And secondly, I expect you to steward your finances to help this church reach other people like you. Two things. Tithe, serve, period. You're a member. Those are the expect. Uh, is that complicated? Is that undoable? Is that chalky? Is that just too hard to get your brain around? No, not really, right? Those are the expectations of this church. Tithing, serving. That's it. Why? Because it's not a cruise ship. It's a battleship. And that's, that's the expectation, by the way, of the kingdom of God and the word of God. All right? Now, once we have the expectations clear, we need to make an allocation of funds toward the harvest. Do you know that we spend 50% of our money that comes in from your tithes and offerings to reach the harvest? Because we are not about programs. We're not about uh, nifty little gimmicks. We're not about anything other than the harvest. Reaching it, 
defining it, discipling it. And we can't do that if we can't identify it. Seeker, believer, disciple, teacher. One of those four places. Uh, Fifthly, we need an evaluation of workers sent to the harvest. So often, no one, no one gives us an evaluation. Can you imagine going to your job and your employer not giving you some kind of evaluation? Some of you are saying, uh, yeah, I, I work there. <laughs> I, I don't know if I'm hitting the mark or not. How do you feel? You, you feel kind of like, how am I doing? Am I doing a good job? Am I doing what, I, what you want me to do? Am I making you happy? Is, is everything cool with us? If you don't have any kind of assessment, right, we have to have an evaluation of workers sent into the harvest. That's why the staff on this church, twice a year, there's a review. We have a, we have a review we go through. When Tina and I sit down in our marriage, home run, base hit, strike out. It's not in an energized setting. It's, in a, it's, it's around a lunch or a, or a cup of coffee at Starbucks or at Forza, because we love our Forza, right? Um, we have an evaluation of our marriage because you have to evaluate. You have to evaluate this thing called life. If you don't take an evaluation, if you don't know what your home runs are, you might stop hitting them. If you don't know what your base hit is, you might not be able to reproduce that. If you don't know what your strikeout is, I promise you, you'll keep doing that, Right? We have to evaluate the workers sent to the harvest. And finally, we need education of those one from the harvest. We have to educate people. Okay, so what do we do here at Foursquare Church, right? Well, we have a life journal, our soap groups. We have a reading plan. We have team camp. We have now what classes. We have uh, NLO, new leader orientation. We have all these things to educate people how to become a better version of them. And, and if people don't have that kind of education, well, you know what they become? They become wheat that never becomes harvested. And if it gets harvested, it just rots in the barn. And I just want to tell you right now that only when we become educated in the things of God, right, with systems, in addition to our symbiosis, does a, a dimensional growth happen within us. Now, okay, how, how, how to develop a process. I want to talk about how to develop a process or implement a process. It's pretty important because I want you to know this. Every family, every church, every business is different. And one size does not fit all, right? One size does not fit all. What I want to encourage you to do is a couple of really practical things, simple things. Number one, make an assessment of your DNA. Make an assessment of your DNA. There are so many great tools. There's the Taylor Johnson temperament analysis. There's the DISC test, T- the TJ, Taylor Johnson temperament analysis. The DISC, D I S C, DISC test. Um, there's a really cool test that Men's Fraternity, uh, we walked through at the, in year three of Men's Fraternity, called Servants by Design. If you go onto that uh, website and, and take that uh, temperament evaluation test. I think all together, people just don't know how God has wired them. R- truly. There are people that just don't know how they're put together internally. And, and really, let's, come on, let, let's not be afraid of discovering how God has made us. Let's not be all fearful about what we don't understand. Let's put our toe in the water. Let's take a DISC test. Let's take a Taylor Johnson temperament analysis. Let's take a servants by design. Let's pay the money and take the test. Let's figure it out academically how God has made us and put us together. Because you really can't develop a system or a process until you know where you're starting from. I want to really encourage you to do that. Uh, number two, uh, get with your core leaders and develop a consensus regarding your church's assignment or your family's assignment or your business's assignment. Do you know that every church's assignment is different? Every family's assignment is different? Every, every business's assignment is different? Aren't you glad that all churches don't do it exactly the same way? How weak and pathetic and anemic would the body of Christ be? But, but you know what? You do have an assignment. You, matter of fact, let your uh, ears hear what your spirit knows. Say this out loud with me. I have an assignment from God. Those are things you need to get your heart around. We all have assignments from God. God has assigned us specific gifts and talents. Right? Mr. Potato Head, I love you. We, remember Mr. Potato Head, right? 
there's the, uh, the big goofy eyes and the ears and the feet and the arms and the accessories and, and then the broad trunk of the potato. We couldn't all just be, matter of fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it tells us there are, there's one body but many parts, right, to this body of Christ. And all of us have a different assignment from God. You have an assignment from God. Isn't that cool? God made you with an assignment in mind. On the drafting table of heaven, God made an assignment within you. Now, number three, write out your process and post it. If your process does not include seeker, believer, disciple, teacher, if it's something different, then write it out and post it. Do you know that this, this wheel, every single staff member of ours, every single leader of ours can, can cite seeker, believer, disciple, teacher. They know that's the process because we're not going to leave them stranded on second base when they got off uh, on base with the leadoff hit. We're not going to strand them. People are going to move around the bases from seeker, believer, to disciple, to teacher. And then number four, refer to your process with frequency. Refer to your process with frequency. Now, if you want to borrow this process, listen, at home, in your family, I challenge you. I challenge you in your home to start looking at the world as the field and start looking at people as the harvest. Rather than seeing your boss as the enemy, see him as a, as a stalk of wheat. <laughs> that would freak him out. Yes, I do see barley in you. You know, instead of seeing your neighbor as the enemy, see him as the harvest. Instead of seeing um, the people in, in your business as, as people that are potentially ripping you off and stealing from you, look at them as the harvest. And then, and then in, in your church, in, in your church that you attend, refer to your process with frequency. Because if you don't, if you just write out a process and, and post it, but you don't refer to it, it'll just become artwork. It, it'll just become something that's on the wall that you never really live out. You see, the simple church process is not complex. It's really quite simple. You just have to see the harvest as the harvest. You have to see the field as the field. And really, you just really need to execute the plan of the process. Moving people from seeker to believer to disciple to teacher. God doesn't want you to be a seeker, right? That's why you find him. God doesn't want you to stay as a believer. I raised my hand in church and said, yes, now I'm a believer. God doesn't want you just to simply stay in a small group and be discipled. I know people that have been discipled for the last 25 years. Come on, get off the cow. Get off. Do you know what I'm talking about? Get off. If you've been sucking the bottle for 25 years being a disciple, it's time for you to step up to be a teacher and start the discipling process for someone else, right? This is what God wants you to do. God wants you to move people from seeker, believer, disciple, to teacher. This is something you can do, but this is something we must do to become the better version of us. Right? God bless you. It's been great. Do it now. Have a good time. God bless. Yo, you got it.